Well, good morning, friends. Uh, good morning, folks. I haven't met yet. If we haven't met, my name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am thrilled that you are here this morning. And no matter where you come from, no matter where you are on this faith spectrum, uh, no matter you believe in Jesus, you don't, you're still trying to figure that out, I hope that we can all agree that being here this morning is better than being at the dentist. Can I get an amen? I don't know about you, but I hate going to the dentist. And don't get me wrong, I, I, when I say that, like it's hard for me to say, my grandma was a dental hygienist, um, my, uh, my stepmom's a dental hygienist. Um, dental uh, folks have probably saved me from all sorts of bad decisions I've made, but at the end, I know I should l go to the dentist, but I don't want to. Amen? Amen? And here's the thing, I think to myself, like, like, it's really not that big of a deal. I can just wait a little bit longer, and that won't be a problem, right? Or no, 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 well, I don't really need it. If I just uh, brush more, floss more, um, stop eating certain things, I won't have to go to the dentist, right? Well, I learned the hard way. I, um, uh, true story. Uh, when I was in college, um, I went four years without going to the dentist because I didn't have enough time, I didn't have enough money, but at that time in the world, uh, when I was graduating college at 22, I would go off my parents' insurance, so if I wanted financial help going, I had to go. So for the first time after four years, I went in, and there was so much disgusting stuff on my teeth, I kid you not, they had to numb my gums to scratch off the filth, to which everyone said, Bleh. But it's interesting. Even though we know we should do it, we have a million reasons why we don't, or why we overthink about it ahead of time, why we get anxious before we go in, and then after we do it, we're like, oh, it wasn't that bad. And then you realize, I just spent more time worrying about it than actually doing it. And I think in the same way, that we maybe have this aversion to the dentist. There's something else that we all struggle with, that we all don't like, but we know deep down it is better for us, but we still don't like it, and that's this. It's forgiveness. I know I should forgive those Astros for cheating my Dodgers out of the World Series. Ah! You Giants fans know you should forgive me for being a Dodgers fan, but you're like, oh, I don't know about that. I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know I should, but I don't want to. I'm strong enough to handle it myself. I just don't think about it. Or about this, what I do is I think about it and I spend more time thinking about it than doing it. So it just goes around and around and around in my head. And then I actually do it and I'm like, oh, I feel so much better. You guys know that dental clean you get when you're done? You're like, oh, there's little gaps between my teeth, like, but the good gaps, it's like awesome. It's so awesome. It lasts for about a week. And, uh, and you're like, oh, it was the right thing to do. And it was challenging, it was difficult, it was uncomfortable, but I'm better because of it. Friends, this is the reality of forgiveness for so many of us. If you Look down, and you have a belly button here. You have struggled with forgiveness at some point. Here's why. Because every human being is made to be connected to other human beings. And those human beings that you are created to be connected to are unfortunately imperfect human beings just like you and me. So they say things that hurt, they do things that frustrate, or they don't do something, and sometimes that's even worse. And then we spend the rest of our time being like, why did they do that? And instead of being like, hey, can you help me understand why you did this? It's like, did you see what they did the other day? Did you hear about, did you see what they posted? I knew it. They're such a... And it's easier to talk about, obsess about, than to actually do. But here's the problem, friends. Just as we know we need to go to the dentist, just as we know that there's, we all have people in our lives who need to forgive one reason or another, we often choose unforgiveness. And it's been said that unforgiveness is like you taking a bottle of poison, you drinking it yourself, and hoping someone else dies. But you're only poisoning yourself. 
It looks like this. It looks like this. It says, they never asked for forgiveness. <laughs> Kyle, I don't want to forgive and forget. <laughs> well, if they need someone to teach them and tell them what they did wrong so they don't do it again. <laughs> they should just know better. <laughs> And the reality is, when we drink this poison, it actually impacts us, and you've probably felt it. You've probably felt the poison of unforgiveness, the way it impacts your stomach. It impacts your stomach every time that person's name is mentioned, or every time they walk into the room, like, oh. And then it spreads from the stomach, it spreads up to the head. And then all of a sudden, unforgiveness is running rampant in your brain, and all you can do is think about that like amazing argument, or that quick zinger, or that thing you want to tell them, or the hope that somehow, some way, they get found out and they get caught. And then what you found out is that they actually now live and own this space right here between your ears. And you realize, oh, the poison went there. But it doesn't stop there, it then goes to your heart. And what happens to the human heart is you go to a place where instead of wanting what is best for them, you kind of hope you walk in one day and find out they got fired. You hope that one day they get uh, expelled from the friend group the way you did. You hope that one day that person in leadership who is supposed to love, care, and protect you, you hope one day you read about them on the front of the newspaper, not for the good they've done, but because they've been found out and your heart begins to change. But the poison doesn't stop there. The poison impacts your eyes and the way you see the person. See, you may not know this, but your eyes have the power to interpret things. You, that person who uh, you have not forgiven, they show up five minutes late, and you're like, they always thought they were better and more important than me. Someone you love and care about comes five minutes late, they're like, they were probably just helping an old lady across the street. They are wonderful. Your eyes begin to change. And somehow, some way, you found yourself being destroyed from the inside out because you have chosen to hold on. Let me be clear, friends. Let me be clear. Let me be clear about what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about forgiving and forgetting. I do not believe that is good for you. I am not telling you that you need to forget about what the person did to you. Amen. That's not it. I am not saying that you need to say what that person did is okay. I am not saying you need to minimize the pain done to you. But what I do think you need to realize is while you hold on to it, it seeps inside you and eats you alive from the inside out. Because right. every time you're invited to a party, everyone's like, is he or she going to be there? Every time there's something that happens in the workplace that you don't know, it's like, oh, it's because of blah, 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 blah. Every time there's a family reunion, you're like, how do I look that person in the eye after what they did to me? And in that moment, you find yourself being eaten alive by unforgiveness. The reason I know this is true is because I've done it, because I've sat with many of you and done it, but also people in the Bible have struggled with this too. You may not know this, but there's a book of a Bible named after a person. They are such a significant prophet. A book of the Bible got named after them. And they struggled with forgiveness. You may know this story. Uh, the story's about a guy named Jonah. Uh, maybe if you grew up like I did, there's a flannel graph thing, and he was there, and uh, he was supposed to go to the desert, and like the rest of us, he'd rather go to the beach called Tarshish, because let's be honest, the beach is better than the desert, sorry. Um, um, and then we're there, and like, oh, then all of a sudden, there's these like weird storms, and then there's this big fish that none of us really understand, and then all of a sudden, he like goes back, and we miss the story. Oh, you may not know about the story is the place where God called this prophet to go. This is a man who believed in God. This man who has great faith. This man who is a great preacher. What you may not know is that he had complete and total love and trust in Jesus. But he couldn't go preach to Nineveh. Why? Because Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And in 922, when he was just a boy, those Assyrians marched across the Fertile Crescent, crushing everyone. And when they got to his village... They did what they did at every other village. They gathered up all of the other people who were outside 
the village gates. Maybe they were traveling, maybe they were farming out in the fields, and then somehow, some way, they gathered them, and they brought them all to the city gates, and they look at everyone and say, hey, everyone in the city, Assyrians are here, and these people who you love, these family members, they're right here, so here's what I need you to know. You are now gonna bow down and worship us, you are now gonna pay taxes to us, and you're now gonna serve the Assyrians only, and if you don't, let me just show you what will happen to you. All of you inside the gate will you get the exact same thing that happens outside the gate, and this is a true story, you can Google it. The Assyrians would literally chop off the heads of every single person there while their loved ones watched, build a pyramid right there, right outside the gates, so every time you came in and out of the gates, you remembered the terrorizing power of the Assyrians. So when Jonah says, no, I'm not gonna go preach to the Ninevites, I'm not gonna go preach to the Assyrians, is it because he doesn't have faith in Jesus? Nope. Is it because he doesn't believe that God is powerful enough? No. If you read the text closely, what does it say? This guy named Jonah says, I don't want to go preach. Why? Because God, I know your loving character. And God, you will forgive them. You will have grace. They will repent of your ways. And God, you will forgive those people. And for that reason, I don't want to go preach. Oh, I just thought he liked the beach more. I thought he was insecure. I thought he didn't have enough faith. See, this story is there to tell us about two things. Number one is the amazing character of our God who says, I will forgive no matter what. And for those of you who are thinking, oh my gosh, I could never forgive that, I get that. I don't blame you for that. Jonah was there. But we see the amazing grace of God, but we also see the struggle that human beings, Jesus-following, Bible-believing people struggle with this. So if you are here, you are not alone. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a coworker, a family member, a neighbor. Maybe for some of you, it's actually not another person. For some of you, the person that you need to forgive is yourself. Because when you look at yourself in the mirror, you have that feeling in your stomach because of the thing you did or did not do years ago. Some of you, it's not an individual. It's even harder than that. You want to know it's harder than uh, forgiving an individual? Forgiving a group. Why? Because an individual, you can see that person, see that one action, but when a group harms you, now it's the whole business. It's the whole group of friends. It's the whole family. And for some of you friends, you've heard me say this, for some of us, church hurt becomes the worst hurt. Because when you feel hurt by a church, it's complicated, because who do you blame? The pastor, the people, the board? Who, who, do you blame God, maybe? Because God, this is your church, your people, these are your people that did it. God, you allowed this to happen. So now who do I need to forgive? That person, the church, God, and it gets all this kind of complicated mess, and here's what happens. The poison seeps so deep into us, what happens is this, we need some antidote to set us free so that we don't carry it. I say we don't wanna go to the dentist, I say that we don't wanna forgive, but let me just say it this way. I wonder if maybe, just maybe, the most selfish spiritual thing you could ever do is forgive someone. Maybe the most selfish thing you could do is forgive someone, why? Because in that moment, you are choosing not to hold a grudge, not to drink the poison, not to continue to have that person control your head, your heart, your stomach, and your desires. In that moment, you get freedom. Friends, if you're a believer in Jesus, I want you to say, hey, I wanna forgive because God forgave me, because the grace of God is so amazing, and I cannot believe Jesus forgave me for what I did, and because of that, I wanna be like Jesus, I wanna love like Jesus, I wanna live like Jesus, and because Jesus did it, I'm gonna do it, and if that's you, I love that. That's where I hope every single one of us are or get to. But for some of us, what you need to know is that thing that you came in here carrying, you don't have to walk out with. There's a better life for you. That's what this whole series is about. Maybe you're new, this is your first time. We're in, a, we're in a week five of a series entitled The Good Life. And in The Good Life, what we're talking about is how the things we think make us happy actually don't. In this thing, we think not forgiving someone makes us happier and telling them off and holding the grudge actually makes us feel better. We think avoiding it makes it happen because if we sweep it under the rug, it's fine. But what we realize is we trip over it later. And there's this other way, there's God's way that seems crazy and upside down to have mercy and forgiveness, which seems so 
backwards and difficult, but maybe, just maybe, God's way is the better way. And if you're open to consider that, go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter five. We've been in here, we've just been going verse by verse through Matthew chapter five. There's these things called the Beatitudes. The term Beatitude comes from a Latin, uh, uh, a Latin word. If you don't speak Latin and you uh, uh, just speak English, think the Beatitudes, think of it as the blessed attitudes. What you're gonna see here in this is in each one of these, there's a transformation of the human heart that allows you to live the best life possible. And here we see it in Matthew 5, 7. What does Jesus say the good life is? He said, blessed, happy, rewarded. The good life is for the merciful. Why? Because they'll be shown mercy. So I'm like, well, Kyle, what is mercy? And I thought we were talking about forgiveness. Now we're talking about mercy. What, what, what's the connection there? Let me clarify some things. When I was 18, uh, I heard it defined this way, and it was so helpful. It stuck with me even 21 years later, and it's this. is the difference between uh, justice, mercy, and grace. And I want you to understand this. Justice is getting what you deserve. You did the crime. You pay the time. Right? You punch me, I punch you back. You hurt me, I hurt you back. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Yes, you did the crime, but you don't have to pay the time. That is mercy. It's letting it go instead of insisting on justice. But then there's a third thing that's grace. If mercy is, or if justice is getting what you deserve, if mercy is not getting what you deserve, i.e. the consequence, grace is this, and this is something that reflects the heart of God. And it's this, grace is getting what you don't deserve. You did the crime, and now Jesus does the time. You see, this is the story of scripture, friends, is that every single one of us have done something wrong. And there's a punishment, there's a consequence for it. And that consequence has destroyed our relationship with God and even our relationship with other people. It even destroys our relationship with ourselves. And the consequence of that is then put on Jesus' shoulders, even though we have sinned against him, rebelled against him, what he does in his grace is says, I will take the pain, the shame, and the punishment for you on the cross. Let me be clear, there's still consequences that we feel but the consequence of a lost relationship with God, others, and ourselves, that becomes solved or fixable because of Jesus' work on the cross. Right. And friends, let me be clear, we're gonna talk about forgiveness, and some of you may never get to that place of grace where you say, I will actually give to that person who hurt me. And if you don't get there, that's okay. My heart for you, my prayer for you is eventually you get there, but that is a miraculous supernatural transformation that God may or may not do in this lifetime. So, in this, this idea of mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. To which you say, that doesn't seem right, does it? But let me just be clear about this. Let me be clear about this. Jesus does not say, blessed are those who do mercy. So what are you talking about, Willis? It doesn't say, blessed are those who forgive. Nope. It says, blessed are the merciful. So I'm like, Kyle, I don't know where you're going with this. I see your eyes, I'm losing you. Let's do a little bit of definition, a little bit of grammar. Mercy or forgiveness is an act. An act that I believe leads to freedom. But let me just say this. But merciful means there's a change, a transformation in the human heart. This is the blessed life you can live, is when you go from not only I'm going to forgive and let go, but somehow by the miraculous power of God, somehow I now want what's best for that person. Let me say it this way. In these moments where we are desperate for revenge, to remember what Jesus did for us transforms our heart. And many of you either A, don't want to do it, or B, don't believe it's possible. I know I'm belaboring this point because I just need to say this. 
I believe that that transformation is only possible through the power of God in your life. And in that, there's this opportunity. See, here's the thing. You have the power to choose to forgive. You can choose that all by yourself. But the, to be transformed in the deepest part of your hearts, that is a supernatural work. For you to get it out of your head, out of your heart, out of your eyes, outside of you, and drink the antidote of forgiveness that not only lets it go but transforms you, that is the supernatural work of God. So if you're there with me and you say, hey, I have the power to choose to forgive, to let it go, to not hold on to the grudge, but I want my heart to be transformed, there's a path. There's a partnership with Jesus. And the same way he may lead you along a path with those little stones, one in front of the other, let me just tell you what this pathway to forgiveness might look like for you. Let me give you five steps of partnership with God that could lead to transformation. Number one, name the impact on you. So I'm like, Kyle, I already do that. No, you don't. What do you do? You name what that person did. And then you name and assume their assumptions behind it, and you name all the consequences that they deserve. That's naming what they did. But naming the consequence on you is where freedom and power comes from. Why? Because sometimes what you may say is, oh my gosh, I've felt hurt by this person, by this parent, by this trusted person, and now because that person has hurt me, I now struggle to trust other folks. Oh, now I can be transformed. Some of you, some of you have lived in such a way that you were only praised when you did it right and now you are addicted to achievement and now the impact that that has had on you that you don't even realize is you feel like you have to be perfect and perform for other people to be loved and accepted. Some of you are in a place where you said, no, the impact on me is that I just have to have this and deal with this forever. But when you name it, what you do is you take the power away from it. And you say, Jesus, I don't need you to change that person. I need you to change me. Amen. Yep. If you live needing that person to be changed, you are a slave to that person Amen. and a slave to your expectation. But when forgiveness allows you and your heart to be transformed, that is how God turns evil into good. Because let me be clear, it's very likely that the thing that you're struggling to forgive was something evil done to you. Nine out of 10 times, I think it's that. And in that moment, when you name it, you allow yourself to be transformed by Jesus. First, you name what it does to you. Second is this. Write a letter. I want you to write a letter that you'll never send with all the words you'd never say. Why? Because every single one of you have rehearsed what you would say if you got them in a room one-on-one. -on -one. Some of, some of you, you've been in the room with them, got so frustrated, you had nothing to say, and then you walk out and you're like, oh, I got it, come back. Oh. Some of you have these scathing words that you'd love to share, and this letter's your spot. But there's also another piece. What I believe that happens in an unfiltered letter that you never send is this. I believe there are pieces of your heart and my heart that we don't want to admit exist. We say, Jesus, live in my heart. But there's this one deep corner full of rage and anger and unforgiveness. Just you don't live in that heart because we're just going to pretend that doesn't exist. You don't name it to yourself. You sure as hope no one else does it. And we think somehow by putting it in really, really good Tupperware, God doesn't see it's there either. <laughs> How could he know? It's really hidden. And what we do when we hide it is what we do is when we leave things in the darkness, it's like mold, it grows and it multiplies. But when you bring these things into the light, you say, Jesus, there's this thing, there's these words, these feelings that I'm not really proud of, but I'm feeling them and I'm honest. God, can you transform that too? Amen. And now you're cooking with grease, friends. Because God's not a bully, he's not gonna force you. He's not gonna say, we're dealing with this. Until you're at a place where you can be, feel safe with the worst part of yourself in the presence of a loving God, then he says, okay, let's talk about this and let me transform it. And no one is blessed by you being polite in a letter that no one's gonna read. Those words need to come out of you, but they don't need to come out to that person. So f first, name the impact on you. Second, write a letter. 
that no one ever reads. Number three is this. I think back to Jonah's story. Could you imagine how hard it is for Jonah to forgive these Assyrians? There's no way I would be able to forgive them if they did that to my family. Whether or not Jonah ever does or does not, that's a fun theological debate to have with your small group. But let me say this, to recover from that type of pain and trauma, you have to do the third one, which sounds cliche, but let me explain it. The third thing in this, this third step is this, you have to pray about it. So, well, Kyle, that sounds so cliche. That sounds like, what would a pastor say? I get that, I get that. But let me just say this. When you pray about it, what you've done in this moment is you've realized that this is a supernatural stronghold in my life that I have not been able to defeat by my own. And prayer unlocks some stuff. Have you been with us through this whole series? The very first week of of the Good Life series started with this, this idea that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who realize that they're not strong enough to do it on their own. Because when they realize that, what they do is they trade their power for God's power. So in this moment of prayer, you realize this is not just some simple superficial thing, but you realize it has a spiritual hold on me and I need the power of God to let it go. So first, you name its impact. Second, you write the letter. Third, as you pray about it. Number four is this. Some of you, after that point, the next thing you gotta do is you've gotta find a way to talk to a professional about it. Whether that be a pastor, a therapist, someone who's been trained in this. Your friends are awesome. I'm glad you're there. They can comfort you, but usually they can't coach you. And usually, if they haven't been well-trained, they can't understand the depths of trauma of some of the things you've gone through. And that's, they're wonderful friends, but they can't do that. And so, well, I don't need to do that. Some of you are like this. It's like how I, uh, my relationship with my dentist. If I just brush enough, floss enough, I don't need to go to that dental hygienist. I'll be fine. I'll do it all myself. And then four years later, they're getting out the numbing cream on my gums, and the person is like, oh, I need to be paid overtime for this, because this guy's disgusting. And she was right, because I thought I could do it on my own. But when I do it on my own, what does it do? It grows. You know, it's interesting. There's a scripture that I think people misunderstand. It's written by a guy named James. Now, if you're in the room here today, you're like, I don't even know if I believe in the Bible, let alone I believe in Jesus. Here's, 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 I got lots and lots and lots of these, but just one thing today that maybe make you open to the idea that Jesus actually is the Son of God, died, resurrected. I know it sounds crazy, but this is it. Something crazier than the idea of him predicting his death, dying, and coming back to life is this. James is Jesus' little brother. And Jesus' little brother thought that his big brother was God. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. I have an older brother. I have lots of thoughts about him. Some of them need to go in a letter that needs to be written. But all that, there's no point at which my older brother convinces me that he's God. But James did. And he says this to this church he's leading. He says this. He says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. To which you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not Catholic. Can't I just confess to Jesus? James disagrees. Why? This word healing is the Greek word sozo. It's the same word that's used for salvation. And it says this, confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed, so that you can be saved from your affliction. And that's this. There's a moment in that where you say, I'm going to bring the darkest things to light. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to admit that I don't have power over this myself. And I'm going to trust that God will use another person in this process. Why? Because in so many times, human beings become the embodiment of God for us when we need his presence the most. Have the humility to say, I need some help. Whether you talk to a pastor, a therapist, whatever it may be, some of us have been sipping the poison for so long that we can't clean it out ourselves. Fifth is this one. I actually think this is the hardest. Number five. Take some water for this one. Number five is this. You have to name the new normal. Well, Kyle, what does that mean? Forgiveness means I'm choosing to let go of the grudge and let go of the anger and let go of that. And I'm choosing to trust that Jesus is the one who gets justice instead of me. That's what forgiveness is. But in the new normal, you've got to figure out. You may say to someone, hey, um, I have forgiven you. I love you. I want what's best for you now. Um, But there's some things in my life you don't have access to. I'm not loaning you money anymore. I'm not telling you uh, my most confidential prayer request because you broke trust. 
I, I, I am not going to trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do because over and over you haven't. I have forgiven you. I love you and want what's best for you, but I still can't trust you with this part of my life because you've proven yourself untrustworthy. Maybe. There's a family member who you need to forgive, and in that moment you say the new normal is this. I love you, I want what's best for you, I'm not holding on to it, but I'm not gonna see you outside of the Christmas, Thanksgiving holidays. Why? I don't want you in my life regularly, I don't want you in my home, I don't want you around my kids, I don't think you are a safe person, I am not gonna do that. I can see you, and a couple times a year, where there's other people around, I feel safe and I can do that. But in, this, in an intimate one-on-one -on -one space, in my home, nope, you've broken trust, you can't do it. Some of you, that might be the new normal, but for some of you, listen to this. Some of you, the new normal may be, I forgive you, and I'm never gonna speak to you again. I'm gonna block you, and I'm gonna let you know that we have no relationship from here on out. And some of you say, well, Kyle, that's not very Christian. Kyle, that's not very loving. Kyle, what would Jesus do? Let me tell you this. Scripture says that God is a father, and I'll tell you, if there's a kid who continues to bully and mistreat my kid, that kid is not coming over to play with my boy. And that's the way God feels about you. And for some of you who struggle to draw these boundaries, what I want you to do to get the courage to have those boundaries is says that God loves you enough and thinks you deserve it. That you deserve to be in a relationship with people who treat you well, talk to you well, do not trigger you. And the God of the universe says, I love you that much to do that. Well, aren't I supposed to show them the love of Jesus? Jesus is like, yo, dude, I died on a cross. I was resurrected. I can do this without you, homie. Right. But what if? <laughs> but what if, can't God do a miracle? Yes, he can. But if he does that miracle, he'll let you know. That's right. And that person will change and become safe and trustworthy again. And in this place, because you forgive them and you've turned from not just mercy, I've forgiven you, but to a merciful heart that says, I want what's best for you. The best thing you might be able to say is, I love you, we're never gonna speak again, but I pray and trust that by the grace of God, one day, not in this life, but in the life to come, in Jesus' presence, in heaven forever, in that moment, God will do what only God can do and restore our broken relationship, because right now, I just don't know if it's gonna happen in this lifetime. But instead of wanting a lifetime of eternal punishment for you, I want you to enjoy the blessing of an eternal relationship with God and his people forever. Amen. That is forgiveness, friends. Is. So what about reconciliation? We're gonna talk about that in two weeks. But let me be clear about this. Forgiveness is your choice that gets driven by you partnering with God towards transformation. Reconciliation takes two to tango and a whole nother sermon. So, we've talked through this. We've talked about how unforgiveness is like drinking a poison hoping someone dies. We've talked about the way we, we start to experience the antidote by choosing saying, I'm gonna forgive this person. I'm gonna trust that God will bring justice when I can't. I trust that there's a new normal for us even if I don't know what that is. And in this moment, we begin to have our hearts transformed. Friends, some of you walked in here not even aware of something and now you're realizing, ooh, I think I'm holding on to it. I think I swept that under the rug. Some of you are at a whole new place where you're like, I could never forgive that person. Kyle, you don't know what they did to me. And I don't, and to be honest, I could probably never understand. And I may never understand the depth of your pain, but let me just tell you what my heart is for you and what the heart of God is for you. God says, I don't just want you to do the act of forgiveness. I want to give you your peace back so that when you walk into the room, that person doesn't have power over you. When you hear their name, you no longer can feel like you're 13 all over again. He wants to transform your heart in a way that you could actually love and want what's best for them. And some of you are like Jonah that says, I want them to get everything they deserve but there may be a miracle for you that he can transform your heart. Some of you, that person in your life has been given so much real estate between your ears. Forgiveness is a supernatural eviction notice that says, I'm not gonna think about you, dream about you, or anything like that ever again. I'll tell you about one person in my life, I just struggled, I did all the things, and.
two, three years later, I still found myself having that person pop into my dreams. And I'm like, God, we got to do some sort of supernatural eviction here. And maybe, just maybe, by the power of God, that can be removed. And this last piece, I know, I know this sounds crazy. And this is maybe something only Jesus can do. He'll also change your eyes so you no longer see them as simply the object of your pain, but you actually see them as a child of God who just like you is broken, just like you has made mistakes, but just like you is loved by Jesus, can be forgiven by Jesus, and saved by Jesus. Some of you are like, I'm gonna do the mercy thing because I'm gonna deal with it, but that merciful part, oh, me and Jesus are gonna have to talk about that. And that's okay. In this moment, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invite you to stand as we have this closing song. And we're gonna do something a little different. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have members of our prayer team here and here. And like I said, again, for so many of us, forgiveness is a supernatural battle. So I just want you to have the courage maybe to get up out of your seats and go and receive prayer from, again, I'll be over here, other members of our prayer team. Maybe you go and say, I just need help with this. Maybe it's not about forgiveness. Maybe it's anything. Like, I just need help with that. Maybe I don't have a prayer request, but I just want to celebrate what Jesus has done. I invite you to come and meet with, pray with members of our prayer team. I don't want to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You want me to go up in the middle of it? Like, I'll go up after service when, like, no one can see me, but right now, what are they going to think? They're going to think that you're a human being and that they're proud of you for doing the work that you need to do. Amen. Some of you are like, well, I'm in the middle of the row. Is someone going to be uncomfortable? I guarantee you that the person on the edge of your seat or at the end of your aisle does not mind doing this so you can go talk to Jesus. <laughs> but this is part of the battle here, friends. We know what we should do, and we talk ourselves out of it. So in this moment, I invite you to respond however God leads you, to name the pain, to ask for transformation, to come here to pray, to write a letter, to send a text, whatever it may be, you know what you need. But the heart of God is saying this, don't walk out of here carrying what you brought in unless you're walking out with a plan to partner with Jesus so you don't have to keep bringing it back every single week. This is the invitation of God to the people of God. Respond however he leads you.